I'll introduce myself. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the co-facilitators of the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE. And I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Young. Before we get into our conversation with our speakers today, we wanted to give you a brief overview of CORE, which stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. CORE is both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using a results-based collective impact approach that responds to community needs. We have the mission and vision statements that you see here with equity at the center that were developed with input from many of you on this call and many of you throughout the community. When we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that everyone across the lifespan has equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. That means that people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predicted for better or for worse by their race or ethnicity, their income, their gender identity or sexual orientation, their immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity. And equity is at the center of this diagram of the core conditions to illustrate that we have to examine and address our individual organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that perpetuate the inequities that we want to eliminate. So before we get into our conversation with our guests today, we wanted to go over a few um, items to build a shared language. And just so those of you who may have attended last week's conversation with representatives from different county agencies know that we have been hosting multiple core conversations on racial equity to learn what this looks like in different parts of our community and we'll continue to do so. So today we're very pleased to have with us four representatives of local nonprofits who I'll introduce in just a moment. And we'll get to hear from them the same way that we heard from county departments last week and we'll hear from others in the future. We did wanna offer some definitions as part of building shared language for these conversations. We know that many of you may use different terminology and different definitions, but we just wanted to offer some that we have found helpful in the conversations we've been having within and around CORE. The graphic that you see here is from Race Matters, and it makes some distinctions between the diversity of people and perspectives or the representation that, that might be evident in an organization or a board or a culture and inclusion, um, which is the kinds of um, voices and powers that might show up in different ways. And then the results or equity that are achieved from actual changes in policies and practices. And we know that many of you are at different points of, of um, incorporating some of these concepts into your own organizations and work. So we're eager to hear from you as well, but we'll start the conversation with some examples um, from our local representatives here. So we think of racial equity, we, we use this definition of racial equity from the Government Alliance on Race and Equity or GARE, which many of you may be familiar with, that racial equity means closing the gaps so that race no longer predicts one's success. And this also improves outcomes for everyone. Some of you may be familiar with this both and approach that's sometimes referred to as targeted universalism which is a concept that we find really compelling and powerful and hope to offer an, a, an upcoming core coffee chat for a deeper dive on that. But it's really been um, popularized and conceptualized by John Powell who leads the Othering and Belonging Institute at uh, UC Berkeley. And he's helped us understand how closing gaps means centering communities of color, to target improvements for those who are most affected by racial inequity and moving beyond services to transform the policies, institutions, and structures, the systems that have really cemented uh, racial inequities. And that's part of the reason for leading with race. So we focus in core explicitly, but not exclusively on anti-racism and racial equity instead of adopting a race neutral approach because racism in the United States has really affected how institutions were structured historically and how they function today. 
and how the success of different um, policies is defined. So by addressing the racial and intersecting inequities directly, we have a better chance to improve outcomes for everyone of all races, genders, bodies, ages, and orientations. So again, that's that concept of targeted universalism, that you target interventions to those most affected, but by doing so, everyone benefits. So it's not a zero sum game. So we think of equity as both the process, the, the way we do things, and the impacts or results that we seek to improve. And we'll talk about that more today and in these ongoing conversations. Before we dive into that though, we wanted to pose some agreements for creating a brave and inclusive space. Um, today's discussion with our guests will be a fishbowl kind of discussion. So that means we'll just be listening to each other, listening to them. Um, we encourage you to ask questions in the chat, again, in either English or Spanish, whatever feels comfortable to you. We've reserved some time at the end of today's longer conversation for your questions and interactions with the speakers, and we'll do our best to protect that so that we can hear more from you as well. But before we do that, we do think it's important to have some agreements together for creating a brave and inclusive space. And we are indebted to our colleague, Hannah Garcia, who's a cultural equity consultant who um, helped us come up with these kinds of suggestions for group agreements in some early work um, with the core steering committee that has really had staying power for us and we hope is helpful to you as well. So just to quickly go through these, the first one, sharing the air, has to do with um, being aware of how much airtime you take up and how you participate in the discussion, whether it's verbally or in the chat. So some of us are naturally inclined to take up more or less air. So it's just a, it's just a reminder to be conscious of that and to share it if you're someone who might take up more and to leap in if you're someone who takes up less. And related to that is leaning into discomfort, taking some risks. Um, we all in these conversations might hear or see things that we disagree with, that make us uncomfortable. We urge you to notice that about your own reactions. Let yourself feel it, maybe not immediately leap to trying to solve it or squash those feelings or make them go away. But often, um, I know this is true for me, and we discuss this a lot in our work together, our team, that um, leaning into that discomfort is the best place to learn. So um, exploring or working through that is, is sometimes exactly the place where we make some progress individually and in groups. We also encourage you to listen fully, be as present as you possibly can. We all have lots of distractions, uh, uh, distractions rather, that can turn into distractions in our, um, in our Zoom-based lives. So um, these are really nuanced, um, sometimes intense conversations, and this one deserves as much of your attention as you can possibly devote to it. So we urge you to do that. Um, on the other hand, if you, um, if you need to do something to take care of yourself, you can see a practice self-care there as well, um, please do so. Um, we encourage you to be curious, to, to call in versus call out. So this goes with listening and being present. This isn't a place to prove who's the most woke um, or enlightened, to judge people by calling them out if they don't meet our particular standards. You may be thinking those thoughts, but this is really about being um, in a spirit of curiosity and learning, um, to, be, to be interested in different perspectives, to be willing to have your own perspectives challenged no matter how hard won or how hard fought they are. Um, being willing to try on new ideas, no matter where you're coming from. So we can really practice that, calling each other in, inviting each other to, to share, to explain, to reflect. Um, so, so challenge is good, but uh, challenge yourself first and in, in ways that feel productive and in the spirit of learning and curiosity. We also really like this one about separating the intent and the impact of of words, um, whether they're spoken or written. So even when we have good intentions, 
we can still deliver things in ways that, that feel hurtful um, to others. We can't automatically assume that just because someone says or does something insensitive that they have negative intentions. So there's there's some benefit of the doubt built into here, but also um, that shouldn't stop us from speaking up and and um, and being direct when 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 it's required. We would like to ask everyone to honor confidentiality. We know that's a little different in a recorded conversation that's going to be shared, but we do. Um, hope that when you're sharing things that you learn from this conversation, that you do so in the spirit of sharing ideas as opposed to identities, which is the way that, uh, that Race Forward puts it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, practicing self-care uh, before, during, and after this conversation. For some of us, leaping into these is just like, great, bring it, let's, let's go. And for others, it feels, um, more like stirring up emotions. It might be a little of both. Um, one of the beauties of these conversations is we don't actually know what's, what's going to happen exactly here. So we um, want to be open to that, but we also know that everybody's coming to this from a, a different point of view. Every day is different, every hour is different, especially in these times. So please take care of yourselves and each other. And if you need to turn off your camera, step away. Um, you know, we, while we want you to be present, we also understand that you may need to do that. So please feel free to do that. So just quickly in the chat or by raising your hand, do you have anything to add to these? Do you have something that feels like it's missing from these for this particular conversation that you'd like to share? We welcome you to contribute those. And we also, with any agreements like these, we really emphasize that they're for all of us to hold each other accountable to. It's not any, any particular person's or group's responsibility. So. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen share so we can see a little more of each other for the moment. So nice to see those that have your camera on. Totally understand if you don't. And so I should have done this earlier, but better late than never, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest today. We have Molly Bean, who's the Education Manager for the Coastal Watershed Council, and Maria Elena de la Garza, who is the Executive Director of the Community Action Board, or CAB. She's also a core steering committee member and has been deep in this work with us all along, as has Monica Martinez, who's the CEO of Encompass Community Services, also a core steering committee member, and Kim Gwen, who is the quality improvement director for Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. So they're about to launch into a fishbowl discussion with each other, which we all have the privilege of listening and attending to. They're going to share some information about their racial equity work within their own agencies, but they'll also have a conversation about the signs of progress they're experiencing, the challenges they're encountering, and how they individually and with their coworkers are handling these. So we think this will resonate with a lot of you. It certainly does with us. We encourage you again to share your comments and questions in the chat, and we'll have um, some time to ask them some questions later as well. Please feel free to um, voice your questions in English or Spanish. We will make sure they get translated into the other language. And, um, Look forward to hearing from them and from you. We've asked each of these speakers to briefly share with us what brings them personally to this work and how their agencies are working on racial equity. So how are they turning the talk that we've all had about racial equity into action? And what are the signs of progress that they're seeing? So Molly, I'll, I'll start with you. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. My name is Molly Bain. I use the she, her pronouns, and I work for the Coastal Watershed Council. If you're not familiar with us, we're a very small nonprofit based here in Santa Cruz, and we love the San Lorenzo River. We love exploring it, protecting it, and helping others to learn more about it. And my role at the Coastal Watershed Council is working with kinderg uh, kindergartners through fifth grade students all across the county. Um, and 
really for me, when I'm working with youth, I want them to feel valued. I want them to feel supported. And I want them to know that their uniqueness is important for us to know and experience and be connected to. And as a white person, I, um, it's sometimes hard for me to connect uh, to the racial equity work, aside from my own personal experience. Um, growing up with learning disability and uh, not always feeling like I was good enough or that there was something a little bit wrong with me or that I had to work harder to get somewhere. And for me, that's really been a grounding for me in the racial equity work that we have um, at the Coastal Watershed Council, where I'm really committed that everyone in our organization and everyone that I work with really does feel validated and affirmed and championed for who they are. And um, I'm, I've really been committed to just being that open voice um, to really encourage that inclusivity in our organization. Um, and with that, we've done a lot of work over the last year to really kind of delve into racial equity as well as um, equity in general. And we started out last year forming an equity committee, um, which consisted of all staff members as well as our board chair. And we would work, we would meet once a week, sharing reflections that we had from the week that related to justice, equity, and inclusion, um, and then delved into different conversations throughout the time frame. First, we started looking at um, Tema Oaken's racial, I'm sorry, white supremacy culture, and kind of just raying ourselves with, on that list on what we are doing that's perpetuating white supremacy, but what we could do that's an antidote to that white supremacy culture. Um, throughout that time, we identified that we needed a consultant to kind of help us with this a little bit. And so thanks for uh, a generous, generous grant from the Packer Foundation, we hired a consultant um, that has been working directly with our executive director in one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as trainings um, that ultimately then builds into uh, twice uh, quarterly meetings with the whole equity team where we're starting to focus on the idea of decolonization and what we can do in how we can support decolonization within our community. And that is a big task. And <laughs> I'll talk more about the challenges that we're having with that. But I do see that that's really opening up some new conversations for us as a team and as individuals. And with that work, um, I'm seeing that we're having many more of us are sending articles to each other and emails, um, videos, lessons learned, and that's kind of opening up some conversations that go beyond our equity conversations or equity calls um, to kind of integrate this more into the organization beyond this once a week thing. Um, and then staff are also seeking out their own training. They're inspired to learn more about how they can be more supportive of racial equity um, and inclusion in general. And I'll speak from myself here, that's really been my drive. I've noticed that not only do I need to be doing this work, I want to be doing this work. And it's been really, um, for lack of a better word, energizing um, to start to see more opportunities to learn more, to question myself, to question my assumptions, but also to continue to find ways for me individually to be more inclusive. And I've done that with our education work. Um, one of the things that I've done is we've done some research on different education equity components, um, looking at universal design for learning, looking at culturally and linguistically responsive teaching and learning, um, looking at social emotional learning, as well as how do we support multilingual learners, and then identify some best practices that we're starting to integrate into our programs. One of the things that I've noticed has been quite powerful about being in these uh, conversations, even though they can be challenging, is that we're starting to see what an organizational cu culture look like, could look like that's inclusive, welcoming, and supportive of each other. And we're starting that when we're in, there, we're in these deeper conversations, we're starting to learn more about each other. We're starting to learn more about the diverse needs of each person on the team. And I think it's helping us build a culture that's gonna be more welcoming of individ new individuals coming onto our team 
because we're willing to have those conversations that perhaps before we weren't comfortable having. And so with that, I'm gonna pass off to Maria Lena. How is everything at the Community Action Board? Thanks, Molly. I appreciate your depth of sharing and setting the stage for this conversation. And I want to first start off by acknowledging the 51 persons who decided to be here at this conversation above everything else on a Tuesday morning after a three-day weekend with thousands of e inbox emails to waiting for you. So let's acknowledge that. Thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, I, I want to say that I'm personally drawn to this work um, and, and I wanted to share, I don't know if you can see her, let's see. Um, and, and this is a picture, a Polaroid picture uh, of uh, my mom. Now, those of you might remember what Polaroids are, but she goes with me everywhere I go when I have to have difficult conversations. When I'm nervous about having a conversation, when I feel um, anxious about it, um, and you can see her, I don't know if you can see her. She was a very humble woman. She worked in a restaurant. She was a, 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 a master chef, but that wasn't the words used at that time. But you can see she's wearing her little chanclitas, her little um, uh, slippers, and her little uh, uh, slip is showing from under her dress. And I, and I cherish this photo because it reminds me that she worked every day of her life standing in a hot kitchen so that I wouldn't have to. And that's the strength and what I bring to this work, acknowledging the sacrifice of a, a, a Latina immigrant mom who didn't know how to drive and didn't speak English and had a third grade education and the struggles that she went through for to be successful and to make sure that her family was successful and taken care of. And so I stand for equity and courage. And you might, you all who know me, and I know many of you on this call, you, you think that words are easy and it flows and it's graceful. It's not. It makes, it's always makes me nervous to talk about this work because it's not easy. And what motivates to, me to do it is because our families are still struggling. Our kids are still impacted by violence. Our, parents are working in the fields and they can't get to work, it can't get to home on time to cook dinner or help with homework, or there's language barriers, or they don't know how to navigate systems, and kids are put in the role to be brokers, language brokers for their families, and are put in places to navigate big situations, and, and, and those are big responsibilities that our systems need to understand how they impact our families. And so I have the privilege and the honor for working at CAB, at the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, which is a wonderful agency who stands between grassroots communities and systems designed to respond to those communities. I get to stand there. That's where we stand. And we're committed to continue to engage with our community, to listen, to learn, to build relationships with the communities that we serve and to help influence and be part of the systems that exist to be responsive to them. And many times in our role, it's, it's you know, Valerie said it, I'll never forget this Valerie from probation. Um, we were in St. Louis and she said, Marilena is an agitator. And, and that's said, and I know it was said with love and respect and grace, yes. Sometimes we have to push a little. Sometimes we have to poke a little. Sometimes we have to, 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 to be brave to say, to be compelled to say that which is scary to say. And so CAB has created a space for that work. And, and we've been working on, on issues of equity um, in, a, in a systemic way and in, a, and in an organic way. The board hired a Latina born in Watsonville to be the executive director of this agency. Bold and committed. And they knew that by having me here, it would create a ripple effect. And I'm not saying I created the ripple, I created it. I was part of it, right? I was part of the system. And, and so what's important is having the, 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 the courage 
to say, and our board did, that we, we as community action needed to reflect the community that we served on all levels of the agency. And so part of that, and that was organic. There was no strategic plan. There, that was organic. Who are we serving and who is serving? And could we serve better if we, if we reflected the community? And we knew we could. I'll give you a really tangible example, a really tangible example as I, as I close off my part of the conversation, because it answers the question, right? Um, signs of progress. We look different now than we did eight years ago, right? And I can give you the stats on that, right? The, the data tells us, it, uh, our internal data, we went from a 75% white-led agency with 25% Latino and others to a 77% Latino led agency and a 23% white agent led agency. And that shift was challenging and important, but it also proves signs of progress because as we reflected the community, and I'm gonna say, and you all have heard me say this, when the community demographics change, we have to change. When the community demographics change of who community action serves, I should not be the executive director of this agency. And to have, and to understand what that means, to understand that sometimes we need to step aside and allow others to come forward. And so that's a lot of information and a little bit of time, but I, I, I look forward to, to continuing the conversation, to sharing our equity strategy um, that has led and moved the work forward. Monica, is it my, I think Monica, you're on. <laughs> Thanks, Maria Elena. Um, I'll have one of what she's having <laughs> this morning. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Monica Martinez. I'm the CEO at Encompass Community Services. Um, you know, I, I just want to start by recognizing that everybody has their own path through the racial justice journey. And this work requires self-reflection, a willingness to grow, and vulnerability. Um, so to demonstrate that, I thought I'd start by sharing a little bit about myself before I share about Encompass's journey. I was born to a American, a Mexican-American family in Bakersfield, California. Um, like a lot of others like me, my family had and still has a lot of internalized racism. Uh, we weren't taught to speak Spanish because my grandfather had been held back in school for speaking Spanish. And um, I'm sharing this photo of me and my older sister. Um, and I remember my abuela telling me quietly that I was her favorite grandchild because of my light colored skin. Uh, despite the fact that my sister and I, we grew up in the same Mexican American household, we had a really different experience from each other navigating our Latino background. Uh, while I struggled to fit in and, and felt like I always needed to prove that I was Mexican enough, um, my sister was subject to more overt bullying and name calling because of the color of her skin. Um, because we were always together, I began to notice the subtle differences in how a stranger or a teacher may respond to us. It seemed like teachers often approached me with opportunity while they assumed my sister wouldn't be very good in school. And over the years, I began to recognize the privileges and different standards that came with being a light-skinned Latino. And that's been really core to my commitment to this racial equity work. Um, in my role leading racial equity at Encompass, I've had to consider what I bring, like the values of my own lived experience, but also recognizing my limitations and um, making sure that I can consciously work to address those gaps um, with other members of my team. And so at it, and within our organization, we're asking ourselves some of those, those same questions. What, what are our strengths and, and what are our gaps? Next slide, please. So Encompass is the largest health and human services nonprofit in our county, and we've been around for almost 50 years, which means that we have benefited from the very structures of systemic racism and white supremacy that we're now trying to change. And we have to own that and name that. In 2019, we went through a strategic planning process that revised our mission and our vision statement. We reoriented ourselves as a health equity organization because we recognized that health isn't something that we just get at the doctor's office, right? It starts in our families, in our neighborhoods, and we work to address the conditions, I can call them the core conditions, <laughs> um, in our community so that everyone has the benefit of a long and healthy life. So to do this effectively, we need to put equity and racial justice at the center of our work. And that's not just our work in the community, but it's also in our workplace. 
you know, we recognize that Encompass, we need to change from the inside out. So I'm going to share just a few steps our agency has taken to expand our understanding of systemic racism, identify our areas of growth and deeper and engagement in this important work. But to be honest, Encompass is one of those organizations that still has a very long way to go. Next slide, please. So our services are guided by looking at the whole ecosystem. So starting at the individual level, then the, the community and, and systems and structures. And so we took that same approach to our racial equity work. We started first by connecting with individual employees and providing safe spaces for connection and reflection. In the wake of the tragic George Floyd murder, we took time to host virtual Zoom pause and reflection sessions to support staff so that we could sit with and process the raw emotions and um, initiate difficult dialogues about how to tackle inequities in our own organization. Through these sessions, we learned that staff of color um, needed a consistent and private space to come together without white staff to support each other and build community. So after hearing that feedback, we began hosting a monthly Color Brave virtual meeting space for staff of color. And this has been one of our early successes. Next slide, please. Uh, the next step, it sounds like this is um, similar to uh, Molly's organization, is we um, launched a racial equity work group comprised of individuals from all levels of our organization. Um, and they're working to develop an organizational strategy that addresses the imbalances of power and structural inequities within Encompass. We intentionally chose to structure this work by um, putting together a committee of employees that represent the, all the levels of our organization and the wide range of diversity within our organization rather than taking a leadership down approach. This is a photo of a few of our work group members. Um, and the work group is using a couple of tools to evaluate our gaps. We'll be using the GARE assessment, as previously mentioned, to evaluate our internal policies and practices. And we also use our annual staff wellness survey that includes questions that explicitly address racial inequity and inclusion in our workplace. We've seen some early successes from this approach. Um, the feedback from our survey last September informed several trainings and staff development opportunities we offered later this year. And staff have expressed they wanted to dedicate more time to address these issues through um, learning from others in our community with lived experience. Next slide. So in response to their feedback, we began partnering with the nationally recognized W. Hayward Burns Institute, BI, um, to lead all 450 of our Encompass staff through a foundational training on racial equity. Our consultants, Sam and Mike, here they are, um, are helping to level set our organization's culture, our language and terminology, and orientation towards structural racism and community-centered community structural well-being. In, in addition to that, um, Sam and Mike are guiding our Encompass leadership team through a series of deep dive dialogues to help us build trust and skills in having difficult conversations. This has been tough for us. Um, Encompass has a culture that has largely been very polite and conflict avoidant. So we're engaging in some real talk in our organization that's long overdue. Um, in addition to that, in response to staff feedback, um, we've teamed up with County Behavioral Health to launch uh, 2021 speaker series on equities, um, inequities, inclusion, and othering um, for our staff and board members and volunteers. And so this is something that um, has been another success because we're hearing that our staff are really appreciating the chance to learn from so many amazing leaders in our community. Um, on the next slide, I'll, I'll end here. This is a slide from BI that really helps us to see our journey of change in our organization. Um, you know, we're recognizing that we need to move, we need to change again from the inside out. We need a, a cultural revolution in Encompass. And so this really helps to frame that orientation. Um, we're moving along the continuum from unaware of structural racism to awareness. Um, and then again, as you know, like it takes people different, different speeds to move along this continuum. But even when you get to the very end of fully aware and ready and committed to make the change, it's a, it's a change work that's so difficult. Um, so, so often when we, we struggle at Encompass, we take a pause and kind of look, where are we at on, along this continuum um, and where do we need to go? So that's just a little bit of a, a summary of some of our progress to date. Thanks, thanks for listening and letting me share so openly. And now I'm really interested in hearing from Kim about what this work looks like at Santa Cruz Community Health. Good morning, everybody. And I'm so inspired by everybody's stories and hearing where everybody has started because we are 
pretty much brand new to this um, structured, standardized work at our organization. So my name is Kim Nugent. I'm the Quality Improvement Director at Santa Cruz Community Health. Um, if you are unfamiliar with our organization, we are a federally qualified health center serving over 11,000 patients in Santa Cruz County, um, providing primary health care in a comprehensive patient-centered model, um, which includes medical behavioral health enabling services such as case management, chiropractic services, acupuncture, prenatal, et cetera, a whole, a whole slew of services. Um, and so our organization started to do this work formally about a year ago with um, forming a small racial equity group, which consists of myself, as well as Ruth Hasso, our revenue cycle manager, and Rosalina Valdez, who is our social work um, case manager, as well as a behavioral health provider. And so a three but strong and mighty team um, started to look at where we could improve racial equity within our organization and really deciding um, in terms of where to start. So is it internally with our patients, stakeholders, because you, there's so much work to be done, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint where you, where you wanna start and make the biggest impact. And ultimately we decided to start internally because that's where we'll have, you know, the most information. I'm in quality improvement, so I, I like data, I love data. And so kind of knowing where you're, you're starting internally, it seemed to be kind of the least um, cumbersome in terms of trying to figure out kind of where the baseline is. And so with our initial work, since none of us have done this, you know, professionally, we've never done it it's standardized. We're just kind of three individuals who bring our, our hearts to the work, um, really trying to focus on why we all wanted to do the work for our organization and why we wanted to start in a place of internally. And so each of us have our, has our own stories that we brought along and why we're passionate about this. And, and for me, being a person of color, having experienced discrimination, racism, personally, professionally, in every kind of aspect of my life, all the way from, you know, being in elementary school as the only Asian kid in the class. I grew up on the East Coast um, in Rhode Island. And so really kind of understanding at an early age that, you know, you're different and people treat you differently. I think really kind of guides the work that I have now as, as an adult realizing that, you know, like Molly, I wanna create a space where, you know, children feel included and cared for and really feel like, you know, this is this is a place and a home for them. And, and my co-group members doing this equity work have their own stories that are, that are similar but different as well and, and why we bring the passion that we do. And so for our, our organization, um, we are trying to start at a place where we're involving our staff as much as possible, even with, you know, naming our group. And so we created, you know, a staff poll of what do, what do we call ourselves, um, the equity work group, a whole bunch of different things. And we landed on justice, equity, diversity and inclusion um, named Jedi. We have a lot of Star Wars fans in our organization, so I think they lean towards that just because of the acronym. Um, but truly, really having that engagement aspect of, of our work from the very beginning. Um, and so, like I said, since we've never done this before, we did start to look at consultants earlier on to basically guide us in this work and kind of give us um, really good information about what they've done with other organizations, how that would fit into our structure, and how we can really make this meaningful. And so we brought on a consultant for the first year that we had started this work to really kind of help with um, really looking at some policies and processes that we had within the organization, as well as how do we engage staff. And so our work truly lived in engagement of staff through site meetings, staff meetings, really starting to talk about racial equity, diversity, inclusion, what that means, really trying to get a shared understanding and, and definitions because everybody comes um, with their own interpretation of what that means. And so really trying to make sure that this conversation is happening with some shared language was important for us. And then really kind of working towards um, really having some true reflection on our policies and procedures within the organization that could use some updating to guide the work and to, to support what we wanna do in the future. 
And so um, in this next year, we just recently started looking at our goals for the next 12 months and really what that means in collaboration with our leadership team and reviewing our strategic plan and our logic model and seeing you know, how this all aligns across the organization. We've decided to adopt policy links blueprint for um, racial equity work and really trying to use that framework as a way to structure kind of our goals and deliverables for the next year. And that's really um, looking internally at our, again, policies and processes and procedures, as well as um, really guiding work with engagement of staff um, and continuing that. And so with um, our internal work, we're really looking at recruitment and retention of staff um, of color, specifically really looking at the diversity of staff and really getting a, a, a better um, understanding of our data in terms of the differences that we see at each, each level, frontline staff to leadership team, seeing what the demographic breakdowns are, even looking at the, the pay gaps if there are any, um, to better understand kind of what we want to do with our policies and procedures to, to make that better. We've also incorporated um, standardized questions on our staff survey to really further get feedback on how the work so far within a year has affected our staff, what they truly want us to look at and what they care about. And then um, creating more spaces for staff to feel comfortable engaging with us. And so we have had these formal staff meetings, um, insight meetings to, to discuss these topics, but really wanting to create more intentional spaces where we can continue to build that trust with um, the people who work with our organization and us as we continue on this journey with them. Um, and that's one of the successes that we've seen is that, you know, over the past year with just trying to be as open and honest and not be perfect, that we've really um, gain the trust of a lot of staff members with their comfortability with sharing their own personal experiences and really understanding, you know, when somebody does come to us, whether or not it, the intention is to, you know, bring that up in, in the larger group to try to really figure out, does this affect policy or is it kind of just a sounding board for them to be able to kind of share their concerns and, and express their um, feelings and share their experiences with us. And I think, you know, really holding dear that trust that people have given us is really important in this work to make sure that you know we can continue to work together and, and build upon this journey because without that trust um, we're not going to be able to make the progress um, in policies and procedures and really make it uh, a better place place for all. Thank you Kim um, and thank you for the first part of the conversation. We're going to move into um, the other side uh, another question around challenges and how do we prevent them from becoming barriers? Um, and the, you know, and and just like there's a journey, right? There's a part of the journey is also a journey of challenges and overcoming those challenges in this work. Um, and and I'll say that that uh, you know that we we got to get real about this work and and how difficult this work is. Um, uh, and I will say in my experience and, and in my experience working with the team of CAB, um, that is a group of people who are completely committed to the mission of, of the agency. You know, we, we've, ex we've experienced challenges um, in this work, right? From, from, from resistance, right? You know, um, I, I remember early on in this work um, and, and, and beginning to shape uh, job descriptions to 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 help move the work forward. Um, you know, having to analyze and, and having discussions around what positions should be bilingual, bicultural positions, and having resistance around. Oh well, you know, th for example, this is just one example. You know, this is a youth program, and you know, frontline staff are bilingual, bicultural, and and that's fantastic. Thumbs up. But the next level of program coordination, oh, they don't have to be bilingual, bicultural, right? That position doesn't need that kind of support. And having real discussions about, let's think about that, right? If, if a young person comes through our doors and, and tells us that, you know, mom needs rental assistance or mom needs a job or, you know, whatever it may be, we need to have the ability to communicate with mom. We need to have the ability to communicate with dad. And, and that is at all levels of the agency. And so, so 
the, the mere um, function of adding bilingual bicultural required for some of our positions to preferred to some of our positions was about a discussion, right? A discussion on how we wanted to respond. What was our scope of, of, of touching the community? That's one example, right? The kind of logistical example that drive our internal systems. And I, I, I will say that this is all of our challenges, but I'm gonna name it. How the heck do we operationalize equity. We all talk about it. We all think about it. We, uh, we all lose sleep about it. Our systems are asking the same question, uh, questions. And, and, and so it was our challenge too. How do we make it real? How do we make it real? And for us, it was, it was about focusing on what I call the spirit of the agency, which, is, which are our values and ensuring that our values reflected the vision of who we are and who we wanted to be. Um, and I'm proud that we have been able to shape that and, and, and use our values as the, as the foundation of our work. Um, investment in capacity building, right? We, we've created, uh, thanks to the work of, of uh, Isaiah Ambrosio and Helen Nguyen Story at CAB, we've created an equity academy and we've invested resources um, to make that happen. Thank you, uh, Packard Foundation, um, to continue our capacity building and understanding of, of equity on all, all levels of the agency and also wonder who gets to be a part of the equity academy? How do people, what is the pathway that we create at the agency to, to, to um, allow those, <clears throat> those layers to be seen or not seen, right? That's, those are the questions that, that we have to push ourselves with. But you, you know what I mean? We have to keep looking at those layers um, and, and investment. You know, we've invested in, in, in long time in, in our partnership with SCORE. I see Elaine here. Um, you know, SCORE partnered with us years ago to talk about cracking the codes and looking at, at institutional racism within our system and within our community. We've created uh, relationships and, and partnerships with people to, to lift our capacity as an agency, lift our capacity as individuals, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have professional development executive coaching options for our management team, right? By a Latina consultant who dedicates time and energy and effort to move, help us move in, in our capacity um, to lead in the agency. And we're also, you know, we, we've had conversations with the board and, and about equity and wages. You know, this is a big piece of the conversation countywide, not just at CAP, countywide and with our funding partners. How do we close the gap? How do we close the gap? Because we know our nonprofit employees are still impacted by poverty because of the, of the, of the ranges around the, those conversations and the limited funds. Um, and I, I want to echo what, what Kim said is, 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 is being challenged in that we didn't have the data. We didn't have the data, our demographic data of our own agency until we stopped and asked. And sometimes that is scary. It's sometimes scary to stop and do a self-analysis, but using data to then move things like our equity strategy, like our equity academy, like our HR strategy in looking, how do we support people to be successful? Where do we recruit? How do we build relationships? Um, and so that's all part of our journey of challenges. And I'm gonna throw it over to, let's see, who's next? Monica, you're next to talk about your challenges um, as an agency, as a leader, as a community person. Talk to us, Monica. Thank you. I can't start without just appreciating the the work that you've done at CAB, Marilena, and just how inspiring it is and what a model for the rest of us on this call and you know everybody in this community um, it's, it's incredible, and I look forward to learning more. Um, you know, I think when it comes to our challenge, which is, you know, one thing that really stands out is kind of the speed and the pacing of such important work, right? So this work is urgent, you know, it's, it's, 
should have happened hundreds of years ago. Like we cannot move fast enough. Um, and when we see health disparities in this community, like it truly is a matter of life and death. Like, I mean, there is no work that's more urgent yet, you know, we are huge bureaucracy and it's really hard to make change. I heard the county talking about this a little bit last week. Like it's just, we move slowly and I'm going to share this example. It's really kind of, um, trivial, but I feel like it's symbolic of kind of a bigger issue, um, at Encompass. So. You know, we heard from staff in our surveys that the staff really want to hear from Encompass when an important societal event causes community trauma, right? Such as a, a police shooting of an unarmed person of color or racially motivated act of violence, right? So like any good bureaucracy, we need a protocol for that communication, right? And we need to figure out who's taking the lead. And, you know, we need a vetting. Is this, is this a trauma that's big enough to mean in a community message right and then we need to figure out like who drafts it and then it needs a review process right and honestly like by the time we have a fully formed message ready to go out we have already heard from people being like wow encompass we're really disappointed that you didn't communicate that this really tragic thing happened and we're like we're trying and you know and honestly like i get frustrated with ourselves i'm like can't we just write a message and send it out so i'm really trying to like con contain my language of, you know, you know what language I'm trying to say, like, what the, let's move this communication out. That, but we're trying, right? And this is the same experience that happens with our much bigger, more structural inequities, right? Like, whether it's our hiring practices, our protocol, like our, um, just moving this work forward, like, I've had to recognize that this is change work, right? Um, yes, it's critical and important change, non-optional change work, but it's change and change takes time. And we've all probably seen, or you should look at the, the wonderful change curve, right? There are folks who are early adopters, eager leaders, let sign me up. And then there are, are the ones we lovingly call the laggards on the other side of the curve, right? That you kind of are dragging to move forward. And um, and when you're an organization the size of Encompass, you kind of have both ends of the continuum. And so, you know, my approach to this is just, um, number one, managing my own impatience. And, um, you know, when I listen to somebody like Maria Elena, I'd be like, why haven't we done all of that yet? You know, and just picking like, one thing and just moving it forward right like for us you know i picked a couple of things this last year like a deep dialogue with my executive leadership team because they've got to learn to talk about these topics honestly right so getting on the consultant and just diving deep and not letting anybody <laughs> off the hook for these conversations even though they don't want to be a part of them right um not everybody but some um and then the other one is was our board diversity it's like i my board, for as long as I've known of Encompass, has never had um, a majority people of color. And I'm just so proud to say that at this month, at the next board meeting, the folks who are voting in will finally, for the first time, at least in any kind of recent history, have a majority person of color board. And that's a huge effort. And it took a lot of pulling and dragging and sitting quiet and leaning in and um, and we're there. And so it just like, we'll get there and then ask, what's the next thing? You know, what's that next one thing related? I'm looking at our hiring practices, if there's anybody from the compass. And, you know, how do we just take it, you know, small bites to make big change? And I feel like that feels good. And and then again, just like I've heard, I heard Maria Lana say, like, I'm losing sleep because I wake up being like, gosh, you know, we're a part of the problem. And and that that doesn't feel great. So um i am going to pass it on to kim let's hear about your challenges thanks monica yeah i think one of our our big challenges is i mean i feel like everybody's gonna think like oh that's so true but it's time it's time to do the work um that's so important um usually because you know in in all of our organizations we are doing this um not in addition to, but in tandem with the other roles and responsibilities that we have and really trying to prioritize that for ourselves as well as for our staff, especially since they feel engaged and motivated when we have, you know, the site meetings and the staff discussions and the trainings and how do we keep that momentum going and how do we really build that into the core of what we're doing, I think is a barrier. Um, 
especially since there is sometimes when it seems like we, we have a lot going on and then there's a pause a little bit and then we have a lot going on. And so we're really trying to evaluate that in the next year to make it more consistent, um, especially since we want to make sure that it's, it's meaningful work that we're not dropping. Um, so that's definitely a, a challenge is really trying to find the time to have this be a core of the space that we have for our staff and our employees. And I think also, you know, not having a fully fledged form structure, it's like building the plane as you are, as you're flying and really figuring out how that how that looks and really kind of being um, understanding with ourselves when it doesn't come out the way that we expect. You know, we have all these plans and all these goals within our own Jedi group of what we want to do and really trying to keep it realistic to what we truly can um, do in the next, you know, month, three months, almost like Monica was saying, like, what's next? Just one thing at a time, really just keeping our focus and making those incremental changes so that we can see progress. Um, I think when you're in the work, it's hard to see it sometimes because you see all the things that need to be done versus the things that you've accomplished. So really making it, you know, a point to, to do that look back and really assess where we started, where we are and where we're going, you know, really put that into perspective so we don't, we don't lose that within ourselves as we're doing the work. Cause I think sometimes that does happen when we're, we just care so much. We're always like, there's so much more that we can do, especially when you hear, you know, other organizations are, you know, further along than you, you're like, oh, we can get there, but how, you know, what's that next step? How can we take that next step? Um, so this, you know, coffee chat is really a great place to kind of learn from everybody who's talking. And I know I'm one of the speakers, but I feel like I've gotten so much for even kind of a, overcoming our barriers and our and our struggles and challenges within the organization. And I think our next piece is really when staff are identified as kind of being, you know, early adopters really want to engage more. How do we bring them into the work in a meaningful way so that they don't feel like it's, it's a space where they just, you know, come and participate, but actually build that capacity up and really make leaders within our organization. And, and how to do that. And I think we're, we're talking about it, but we don't necessarily have, you know, a plan or a structure to do that. But it's something that we know is really important and um, a challenge for the next year with really kind of incorporating more valuable input um, into, the, into the JEDI group for the benefit of the staff and the organization itself. And so I'll pass that on to Molly. What are your challenges or barriers and what are you working through? Thank you, Kim. Where do we start? <laughs> I So to be honest, I don't think we've been challenged enough. I think one of the things that Nicole mentioned at the very beginning is, you know, challenge is where the growth comes and challenge is where you learn the most and you identify more about yourself and where you can improve and where the organization improves. And so I think even though we've had challenges, I think we need to invite more challenge, if you will. And a couple of things that come to mind is as a small organization, um, if two people in an organization decide to do something one way, that becomes the culture of the organization. And so looking at the organizational culture, how do we grow to be a point where each perspective, each need, each interest um, is valued and respected and incorporated into the dynamic of that organization. And so that's been a challenge that we've experienced while we're having these equity conversations is how do we, how do we work with each other that has diverse approaches to learning, diverse approaches to communicating and um, relating to problems and solutions. And so I think for us, that's been a growth area, but it's also been a way for, oh, a moment for us to learn more about what we could improve on. And I think one of the ways that's really been highlighted um, is when we're working with our consultant. Uh, they are amazing. They have really challenged us because the mindset that the thing that we're really working towards is decolonization. We didn't start at the kindergarten level looking at justice, equity, and inclusion. We went to the graduate PhD level of de decolonization. And that's been a real challenge um, without having, we uh, are dedicated to it. We're not quite sure. 
what decolonization is. And that's part of the process that we're learning with our consultant is that we don't need to have the answers right now, even though we want to have the answers right now. Um, we are challenged in having uh, a consultant that's so committed to having a decolonization approach to teaching that for individuals that might have different needs on how to learn, we're trying to figure out how do we balance those two coaches, uh, those, those two approaches to learning and teaching. And um, it's been fascinating to be a participant in that, but also being a teacher. And so for me, there's been so much growth seeing how we can create a classroom environment, how can we can create an organizational environment that supports decolonization. So that's been a challenge for us is like going to that PhD level quite soon into our process. Um, another thing that goes with that decolonization is a nonlinear approach to working on this. Um, we have many, many different starts on this conversation. Um, and we started creating a justice and equity agenda. And then halfway through, like, we don't have enough learning. We don't have enough information yet to really um, authentically create that. And so we stopped that and have had multiple situations like that where like, oh, we need to learn more before we can start more. So that non-linear approach, that non-typical uh, way of approaching problems and strategizing has been a new learning experience for us. Um, and I think another component of this, and this kind of shifts into how we can prevent barriers, is safety. How do we ensure that each individual and organization and those coming into our organization feel safe, um, communicating their ideas, expressing their needs, and so it's about how do we model that for each other? How do we welcome that in each other? And how do we have leaders that model that transparency and models um, having welcoming those deeper conversations? And um, I think for us, it's really at that fundamental level of just celebrating each other's uniqueness and welcoming how we can learn from each other and each other's perspectives. Um, and also just being uncomfortable with, I don't know. We don't know the answer right now, and it may take years for us to get there, but part of it is just being in that journey and learning day to day more about ourselves, more about each other and the organization and how we can help um, decolonize um, at least our organization at some point in our community. So I think I'll, I'll leave it with that. Well, thank you so much to all four of you um, and asking, or, or you know, understanding that what we don't know is such a perfect seg to asking questions of, of you and of each other. So I'm gonna invite you to do that in the chat or by raising your hands, but just a couple observations, you know, thanks Molly for, for um, talking about decolonizing and just the, the leapfrogging over, you know, from talk to action and really pushing and inviting challenges and constantly asking what's next, what's the next thing, um, and, and understanding that, the, as Monica said, the things that seem trivial really aren't so trivial and you just have to keep chipping away at them. Um, I think each of you has really been sharing some, some really thoughtful, but you know, real and, and provocative uh, parts of your experience. And I just love the Jedi name and may the anti-racism force be with you. <laughs> so just, just really appreciate all of the the contributions our speakers made. And the great thing about Santa Cruz County and our local nonprofit scene is we could have convened multiple panels like this and, and will in the future. Th this, is, uh, this is a great all-star group to talk to us, but there are many others um, out there and some of you are on this call. So it's just so encouraging to hear um, how dedicated you are to struggling through all this. So what, let's see about some questions that are coming through in the chat that some of you may want to address. Um, so a question from Stacy Garcia is, um, she's curious to hear what's been a joyful, energizing moment in the work. I know we've just been dwelling on some challenges and there are plenty of them, but what's, Molly, I think you mentioned that you find this really energizing work. Is there something that stands out for you? I think so. Honestly, it's being in the challenge. Being challenged um, for me is always where I grow the most. 
And uh, working with our consultant has been one of the most challenging things because of the different cultural dynamics. And for me, being a white person in typically in a mainstream culture, um, I'm not often challenged. But I, there was kind of like a reverse challenging where I got to experience what it might be like for someone else. And for me, that wasn't draining. That was incredibly energizing. Be like, I had multiple aha moments that helped me identify how, as an educator, I can remove those um, uh, challenging moments for students that I might work with. Great. I'm, I'm really noticing how you don't see this as separate from your work and really embedded in your role, your work. Um, so, and Monica, let me, oh, Maria Elena, did, did you have a comment? Yeah, can I jump in with that? I, I want to say, um, it's such a great question, Stacy, because, you know, we, we uh, in, when we do this work, sometimes it's exhausting and overwhelming. Um, and sometimes it's pushing a boulder up a hill, right? And sometimes we feel we're the only ones pushing the boulder. And so your question is really, really important to me. And I want to say that something that has been really important, enjoyable, enjoyable or joyful in this process, there's two things. Number one, this is a sacred moment in time. There has been a window that has opened up. Um, because of Black Lives Matter, because of the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we've experienced in, 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 recent, in our recent past, there is a window of time that we can impact change like never before. To have the conversations with, with systems people and systems representatives, and we're having co hard conversations like, like this one, um, I've never seen before, and I've been doing this work for over 30 years. And so, so joy for me is, is being able to, to be in this space and time right now that we can make a difference. And then the second answer to that important question, Stacey, really quickly, is our ability to bring head and heart together. This work can't just be done on data, evidence-based practice, research. It has to be a part of it, but that's not the only fuel. This work also has to be done with hearts and connections and relationships and, and knowing being part of networks and conversations. And so the joyful part of this work is bringing heads and hearts together. Thank you, Maria Elena. Um, but on the topic of moving boulders uphill, um, we also had a question about um, are there best practices or approaches to engaging some of the employees or others who might be in denial or are unwilling to participate in the equity work to some degree? And Monica, I'm remembering your slide. I think I'll share it for just a moment for any of you to comment on it. Maybe I'll start with Monica of just some of these, these changes in awareness along a, a continuum um, that I think speaks to some of this, of moving from denial to, to being more um, cognizant of what's required and then participating and being part of the change. Yeah, I mean, I found this slide to be very just helpful in bringing some empathy to where folks are, um, both, you know, for others and also myself, right? At what point do I find myself you know, I liked how you started to enter the most woke person in the room or, you know, what is it? You know, we're all, we're all coming at this from a different place. And I think that, you know, I, I find that one of the most useful tools really is, is practicing patience and empathy with folks. Um, you know, we as an agency, we're not where we need to be or want to be. Um, we have a, a, a long journey ahead of us. And it's going to take some really difficult conversations and some difficult decisions to get us where we need to be. Um, we're committed to that. Um, and I'm committed to that as the leader of the organization. And I think that, um, you know, the, the train has left the station. And so I think that, yeah, um, you know, as we <laughs> lovingly call the, the laggards, that might take them a while to, to get on board. But, you know, our work is justice work, right? We serve the most vulnerable members of the community. We're a health equity organization. You have to have some amount of commitment to that 
<laughs> in order to do this work effectively. And this might not be the right place for some folks, right? There, this might be a time for some people to self-select off the train. I, I hope not. We all have workforce issues. But if this isn't if, if this isn't what calls somebody to this work, then then I think you know there's there's discussions to be had there. Um, but but that said, you know I. I want to assume good intentions, and I want to assume that folks are navigating whatever backgrounds they they're coming to our organization with, and provide space, uh, safe spaces for those dialogues, provide opportunities to learn and um, and a growth mindset, and really really hoping that folks will engage in a meaningful way. Um, and of course, fueling you know they always talk about change work. Put put the energy and fuel behind. Don't. Don't put all your energy into the laggards, right? Fuel the people who, who are there, who get it, who are your leaders, who are begging for this work. Give them the resources and energy because then they can fly and they can take off with it. And that's going to move things much faster than trying to wait for that one last left behind person. <laughs> so, yes. And they may bring that person along with them. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So um, we also have a question from Elaine Johnson about pathways for African-American people in Santa Cruz County to have a seat at the table, like being on a nonprofit board. And I know some of you are active in those board recruitment, board expansion, board matching kinds of activities. Do you have any suggestions for Elaine, any, any of you? Let's talk, Elaine. <laughs> Let's right. talk. Right. I, I, we, you know, people will, are, are I, speaking on behalf of CAB, we're open. We're always wanting, wanting to build relationship because that's what it takes, building relationships and alignment and values. And if you're in alignment with CAB's values, if you're in alignment with Encompass values, wherever it is, Elaine, let's talk. And I know I'm speaking for everybody else on this call. Mm -hmm. We need you, are. Elaine. We need you. And thanks, Maria Elena, for highlighting it. relationships. And many of you mentioned trust one way or the other. Um, as part of this work, and that's that's a big part of it. Who's who's on the board? Who's informing decisions? So thanks for the question, Elaine. Let's see. Do we have other questions for each other? You could you could also raise your hand if you'd like to just pose a question or put something in the chat in either English or Spanish. And. I might share, you know, I, I had mentioned the, the board recruitment process earlier, and I had noticed that people had, a couple people wrote questions about um, uh, board recruitment prior to the session. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if there's any board members on the call. <laughs> you know, just, just to be honest about that for a second, and I hope this is a safe space to do that. You know, at Encompass, you know, we've had like, for decades, like a check mark, like, you know, Latina representation or represents the community representation is like on the list of type of skills that we need or, you know, assets that we need on the board without a very genuine or authentic approach. Like, okay, well, actually, what does that look like? What does that mean? How does that change the governance of our organization and where are we going? Right. And so we, you know, did some pushing with some support with the racial equity work group on the board. Like, what does this mean? We really need some action around this. Yet, what we were seeing was that, you know, our board members, predominantly white, were looking around and being like, I know somebody great. I work with somebody great on the board, like their, their peers and their colleagues who were also white, right? They were just letting folks kind of walk on the board who looked like them and act like them and were their colleagues. And so, when we put some pressure on that, like, okay, we really are, we're looking for diversification, like, how can we do this? We had some board members who, who said, okay, well, we, well, now we need a process, you know, now we need, now we need a set of interview questions. Now we need a panel, like, what questions should we ask new board members to get on the board? And, and I had to pause and say, you guys, like, you've been letting your friends <laughs> walk onto our board for decades. And now we're talking about having people of color join and now we need a panel and now we need an interview and now we need a process. Like that looks like structural racism, right? And and having that really honest conversation with the board. Who's my boss, by the way? Um, you know, I was, I was like sick in the stomach for days before I had this conversation. Um, but naming, like that's what that looks like. And so I'm not against having a process. Like we should have a pr process. We want strong board members, but it should look the same for everybody, right? Um, and so, 
so as a board, you know, they are doing a lot of work about what is their recruitment process? What does that look like? And, um, and I feel like they've made some really great progress. And so I feel like, you know, that's kind of a lesson learned that like, sometimes you have to call it out when you see it, you have to, you have to stay diligent, you have to push. Um, and, and, and we really um, elevated um, a Latina who was on our board to say like, okay, you know, help us, help us take the lead here. And she's been fantastic in, you know, building a, a process that is culturally appropriate, um, you know, widens the scope of what we're looking for, right? This is, you know, similar to some of the hiring practices, like widening the type of lived experience um, that that is valued on the board. You know, we don't just like our little checkbox of like, need a accountant, need a attorney, need a whatever, you know, like actually what 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 lived experience is most important to us, right? Um, and so it's been it's been a journey, but it's um, been one that I think was it was a battle worth choosing, right? You know, you kind of we all go through this work and kind of choose like where you're going to put your neck out there, and and this was really important. Um, and I feel like that's um, that's something I can offer for folks who are thinking about you know how am I going to get my board on board for diversification? Thank you, Monica. Good advice and um, kudos for pushing and standing up. Can I can I add something to that conversation? Thanks, Please. Monica. For for our agency, many of you know that we have um, a board a governance structure that we that are, are is dictated by our bylaws and 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 because we're a community action agency, we are required to have five low income. Um, uh, uh, board member representatives on our board, people with lived experience, many of them have been clients or, or, or deal with issues of poverty every day in their neighborhoods, in their communities, in their families, right? Sitting with five elected officials who make decisions around policies with this in this county. Um, sitting with five private industry folks, right? Folks who, who, um, who, who are impacted by poverty or, can, or parts of systems um, uh, with poverty. And so that, that, that fr from, from our base, that creates an opportunity. And I want to say that we also have to invest in, in the success of who sits on our board and who our managers are and who our leadership team is. You can't just throw someone who's never been on a board before into a board without a support, a network of support. And so with those policies that we create what we want and how we shape our bylaws also have to include success strategies like investment and development, like um, reimbursement policy for transportation expenses, like reimbursement policy for childcare expenses, like um, a buddy system and mentorship for new board members, right? That has to be part of the strategy. Don't throw me in as a woman of color without support. I, um, I want to be successful. I want to create relationships and networks and I might need support because this might be the first board I've ever been invited to join. Thanks, Maria Elena. And that's speaking to, to Elaine's point also in the chat about what it feels like to, to be in a room or a table kind of being judged and assessed by, by a group that doesn't look like you and how intimidating that is. So really, really important for every point of the process. Just want to call out some of the other um, items in the chat. So Nancy, thanks for um, for your contribution there about a monthly young um, environmental and social justice group to share successes and challenges working for justice meeting coming up September 13th. And Nancy's put her email address in the chat if you want to learn more about that or, or possibly join yourself or refer that to others. So thanks for that. Do you have questions for each other? I know you were asking each other questions in this fishbowl way, but did some, something come up for you that we hadn't had a chance to discuss yet? Maria Elena, it sounds like you might have something. I have a question for my fellow panelists. Um, can, you, can you tell us how much of your time, energy, and effort has been dedicated in equity work over the past year and a half or so? I can tell you what my percentage is, but I'd love to hear what, what, what's the effort? What's the investment in effort? Kim and Monica and Molly? So for me, the formal, I guess, time investment is an hour or two a week, um, knowing that that's, you know, when the actual group forms together and, and does kind of the planning. 
and then probably an additional, you know, two to four hours a week. And that is, <laughs> you know, work that you have to do on yourself with trying to learn and grow and, and read and watch and kind of absorb everything that you can so that you feel, you know, like, you know, you were chosen to do this work. And so you have to prove your worth sort of um, in that sense. And so, yeah, I would have to say anywhere from like four to six hours a week on top of, you know, your, your regular job. And I still feel like that's not enough um, as many people, people would feel. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, I feel like that's a trick question. <laughs> because, you know, it's like this, um, you know, I can answer by way of hours and, you know, a handful of hours here and there with our racial equity work group and whatnot. But really, like, if we, we're really trying to orient ourselves as a health organization, right? And so, like, if you take, like, a health and all policies lens, like, every conversation we're having relates to health disparities, right? Every thing that we're doing relates to leveling the playing field and creating equity. And so like, that's something that I feel like has been a little bit of a wildfire in our organization where, you know, as we've built awareness, as we've, you know, engaged every person in our organization in a foundational training, like it's, it's, it's becoming more of, you know, not that one person who mentions racial equity, you know, once in a while to like, many, many of our conversations are like, how do we do this in a more equitable way? And it's not easy. It's not like uh, the answer is there. And then we say, let's let's pick that route. Um, that requires more digging, more learning, more uh, data pulling, and, um, and a lot of really difficult conversations, right? And so I feel like you know, going it, going back to that continuum, we hit that kind of awareness of structural racism once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so then it just comes up so much more. Um, we, we, we are trying to move further. So like, you know, how do we, I, I, I love a good protocol. <laughs> you, was, you said that, like, how do you operationalize equity? You know, it's, it's so hard. Um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Um, Molly, do you want to add anything? Yeah, well, I agree with Monica. Like my my immediate thought was like, what percentage of time is probably 90% because I don't see this exclusive of anything else that I do. I feel like this has to be integrated into how I plan lessons, how I teach, how I work with partners, how I run meetings, how I listen to others, um, how I'm doing research, et cetera. So I feel like I can't do my work without that having to be at the very forefront of what I'm doing. Um, yeah. So important. What about yeah. you? I want to hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it's the same. I, it is probably 85% of my work because it's in every level of everything that I'm doing. And I wanted to ask that question. I wanted to ask that question because I want us to get a sense of what it means, right? The, the, the tip of the iceberg is two or three or four or five or six hours. What's beneath the surface is a deep commitment of, of investment of time, energy, effort, and resources. And that, I think, is, is why we need to continue the conversation and why I wanted to ask that question. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And I know we're running short on time, but I noticed that um, that Stacy put a note, a, a link in the um, in the chat to rise together. Stacy, do you want to say a word about that before we turn to any upcoming events? Um, Maria Elena is part of Rise Together as well, so I just wanted to share that resource. But um, Rise Together is a group of. 17 um, BIPOC leaders in our community and a team from the Community Foundation. We've put together this list of equity in action, just some tips for you as an individual organization um, that was compiled by that group. So it's a good resource if you'd like. Fantastic, thank you. And then one last question to the panelists. Um, do any of you wanna comment on how much of your work is dedicated to in-depth training for staff on internalized white supremacy? I know some of you touched on this already, but just a specific question about that kind of training. So our entire organization is white. So this is a really critical thing for us to be looking at and we haven't done enough of it. Um, I think the one thing I we had done is look at the white supremacy culture that uh, Tama Oken has written about 
Um, but we need to do much more of that. So I think some in-depth training about what that looks like is important. And I think the more we learn about decolonization, we're gonna to start to see more of how that's manifested in our work. Thank you, Molly. Before I turn it over to Nicole to close us out, I also wanna thank the other members of our team, Gisela Carrasco, who's been translating the chats, and Stella Larman, who's been doing the live translation on the Spanish channel and does so much for, for us at CORE, both of them. Um, so thank you to them and to all of our panelists and to all of you, as Maria Elena started out saying that the people who were on the call took time out of this post long weekend um, moment to be together in this conversation. Not the first, definitely not the last. We'll see you at future ones and please, um, fill out the feedback survey. We do make adjustments like having more time for questions uh, week to week, and we appreciate your being here and your feedback. Thank you all. And then just to let everyone know, we are um, taking a break from the core events next year. So uh, next year, <laughs> next week. <laughs> Uh, so we won't be hosting a core coffee chat or conversation, but we wanted to share some registration information for a couple of events next week that you might be interested in. One is called this People Power Change Work pop-up um, convened by Upswell, where it's uh, basically kind of like today, from what I understand, that you, know, you get to hear and be part of conversations with other people and organizations that are working on things like racial equity, um, so it's free, it is a few hours long, but there are different workshops um, that you can uh, listen in on or participate. In. So you really, you could participate in as much as, or as little as you have time for. Um, I've signed up for a couple of their events in the past and find them really uh, kind of informative and inspiring. So thought that might be of interest to, um, to folks on today's call. And then this other one, um, we're actually encouraging, because we've seen several of our local nonprofits um, develop really robust profiles of their organizations on GuideStar. It's a great uh, kind of resource and a way to showcase what you do. And, and there are uh, sections of GuideStar in, the, in nonprofits profiles where you can actually talk about um, not only your results, but uh, kind of your racial equity focuses and, and work and staff and board demographics. And again, so it's just a great way to, they have this seal of transparency that nonprofits can uh, work towards based on how much information about your organization you're making available for. And this is really geared towards um, potential donors or funders if they wanna learn more about your organization. So we know some of you have really robust profiles on here. Others of you might have less information, but there's basically a uh, free TA uh, technical assistance offered by Candid is the organization that uh, manages GuideStar. Uh, we've, I've signed up, I think Nicole Lesn might be signed up next week to also learn about this so that if local nonprofits want to um, learn more or get some you know, more localized support in building out your profiles that uh, we might be able to help with that as well. So we wanted to suggest those as two options for next week since we will not be hosting a core event, but we will be back on September 21st and we'll send information about the rest of our September schedule uh, later this week. And I think that is truly it for today. So thank you all so much for joining us for another of these core conversations. Thank you so much, Molly and Maria Elena and Monica and Kim for a really uh, powerful, in-depth conversation. I know that um, you know you each just got a chance to scratch the surface on what you're doing, but so, so powerful. So thank you so much.